When you're dating someone, you are accepting their baggage. You are accepting that they may have secrets or things about them that they don't want you to know. But sometimes you date someone who is involved in things that you would never approve of and that you had no idea about the entire time. And when those things come back and affect the entire family, the results can be so, so very devastating. But before we get into the case, if you are a glasses wearer like me, you're going to want to hear from today's sponsor, GlassesUSA.com. If you haven't already heard, GlassesUSA.com is one of the biggest eyewear retailers in the U.S., offering thousands of eyeglasses and sunglasses, offering pretty much any style and color you can imagine. And the best part about GlassesUSA.com is the price point. Glasses start at just $39, which is up to 70% off of retail prices. They offer some of my favorite brands such as Amelia E, which is the super cute pair that I'm wearing right now. I also have a pair of Amelia E sunglasses, which are my favorite for vacation or just going out in general. But they also offer designer brands like Gucci, Oakley, and Ray-Ban, which is another of my favorite brands. I also have these super cute sunglasses in their rose gold color, which I have been loving as my everyday pair. But if you're like me and you normally wear your contacts throughout the day and your glasses at night, don't worry, they've got you covered. GlassesUSA.com is also the perfect place to stock up and save on your contact lenses. You can get 25% off all contact lens brands, including Vista, AccuView, Dailies, BioInfinity, which is what I wear, and so many more. They are available with any prescription and for all uses. Now, when it comes to online shopping, the endless choices can sometimes feel overwhelming. But GlassesUSA.com also offers a virtual try-on tool, which makes it so much easier to figure out what style of glasses you like and what looks best on you. Also, shopping online at GlassesUSA.com is risk-free with free shipping and returns with 100% money-back guarantee within 14 days. So, give GlassesUSA.com a tryout for yourself. They are offering a crazy discount on top of any coupon code they currently have on their website just for you guys. It's only available for 24 hours, so click the links at the top of the description box to get all of the details. Thank you again so much to GlassesUSA.com for partnering with me on today's video. For the remainder of the video, I will be taking my glasses off and putting my contacts in because I know the glare can be bothersome for some people. Also, I just wanted to give you guys a quick reminder that CrimeCon 2024 in Nashville is right around the corner. It's the last weekend of May going into June. There's going to be so, so many amazing guests there. I'll be there. I'm so, so very excited to just experience everything and to meet all of you guys. Tickets are selling out very quickly. So if you have not yet gotten your ticket, you can use code Rachel Shannon to get yourself a little bit of a discount on your pass. I'll see you guys all there. With all of that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the tragic death of Monique Bao. Monique Bao was born to parents Wanda Williams and Frank Bao. At the time of her death, Monique was 28 years old, living in the Minneapolis area in Minnesota. She was working as a real estate agent and was the mother of two young daughters aged one and three years old. She was dating John Mitchell Momo, who was the father of her two daughters. John was an up-and-coming rapper at the time, but he was also involved in selling drugs at one point. I will get more into that in a few minutes. According to those who knew her, Monique was the life of the party. She had an infectious smile and a bubbly personality that drew people to her. Those who worked with her said that she was driven to succeed and did well at her job. She was also the most dedicated and involved mother to her young children, who she absolutely adored with every fiber of her being. But unfortunately, whatever it was that her boyfriend was involved with tragically cut the time that she got to spend as a mother very, very short. On December 29th, 2019, Monique had received a voicemail from a woman who introduced herself as Lisa Palowski. Lisa was inquiring to set up a showing for a home located in Maple Grove. As soon as she saw the voicemail, she called Lisa back, asking her to text her to set up a time to do the showing. The two agreed on December 30th at 11 a.m., so when that time came, Monique showed up to the home expecting to do the showing. But when she was there, she received a call from Lisa stating that she was running late 
and asked if she could reschedule the showing. In this call, Lisa also asked whether the stove in the home was gas or electric, which Monique thought was a little bit odd. She also wondered how Lisa got her personal phone number. Nevertheless, the two rescheduled the showing for the following day. The showing was then scheduled for 3 p.m. on December 31st, New Year's Eve. So, when the day arrived, Monique left her children with her mother and John at her mother's house before heading to the home at 3 p.m. However, when she got there, she wasn't met with a woman named Lisa. Instead, two men pulled up in a U-Haul, entered the home after Monique, and then forced her into the back of the truck before driving away. For the two hours that followed, this U-Haul drove all around Minneapolis with Monique trapped inside. As that was happening by 5.40 p.m. the same day, Police also received a call to report a shooting that occurred at Monique's mother's house. Turns out, a masked assailant just walked into her home and shot John, Monique's boyfriend, multiple times. When police arrived, John was still conscious and able to yell to investigators to come upstairs to where he was. He was found lying on the floor in his bedroom with multiple gunshot wounds. Thankfully, Although his daughters were in the home with him, they were unharmed. Then, about an hour after that, another resident in the area, just miles away from the home where John was shot, called 911 to report hearing three gunshots go off in an alley behind their home. Police responded to the area, and there, they found 28-year-old Monique lying in an alley after being shot in the face and chest at close range. At the time of finding her body, she was in horrific condition. She was covered in blood. One of her teeth had been broken. Her hands and neck were bound with duct tape, and several of her acrylic nails had been ripped off of her fingers. At the time, unfortunately, Monique had been dead as a result of her injuries. So at this point, obviously, something really bizarre is going on here. Someone just came in and shot both Monique and her boyfriend pretty much at the same time, even though they were in completely different locations. Thankfully, John did survive his injuries and was able to give some insight to police on what may have been going on. John ended up telling the officers that he was at home and downstairs when he saw the door open. At first, he thought that it was Monique returning home, but instead, a man entered his home. The man was wearing a mask with only one hole cut out for both eyes. The man immediately fired multiple rounds, shooting John several times. As that was happening, John was able to run up the stairs, and as he did that, he shouted to the shooter, saying, I'm already dead. My babies are here. At the time, the shooter then fled. Upon looking more into the scene, police found a number of shell casings belonging to a 45 caliber gun, as well as a key that the gunman used to enter the home. So, somehow, the assailant had keys to the home. In the interview, John went on to say that he believed he was the target of the shooting because he was always flashing money on social media and boasting an expensive lifestyle. Maybe they wanted his money. Either that, or maybe there were people who believed that he was cooperating with police, which was not true. But then, police found out that there was something else going on in John's life. So, John had previously been working with a man named Lyndon Wiggins, a fellow musician who worked with a music company with whom John had a recording contract. Lyndon also sold drugs to make money at that time. However, the two had a falling out in early 2019 due to Lyndon accusing John of stealing his music. The two didn't really interact that much after the falling out until they randomly bumped into each other just months after the falling out. After they randomly bumped into each other, Lyndon was actually arrested on drug charges. Due to the fact that he had just bumped into this man who he had problems with right before being arrested, Lyndon was convinced that John was a snitch. He believed that John provided police with information and that he was responsible for his arrest. So, based on the information John gave police at that time, they went ahead and started looking into Lyndon Wiggins as possibly being involved in Monique's death and John's attempted murder. And 
Once the investigation was started, they realized that the whole situation went a lot deeper than initially anticipated. I want to note that a lot of the information I'm about to tell you came from a combination of two confidential informants who spilled the tea on Lyndon, as well as cell phone data and traffic cameras. Officers found out that Lyndon Wiggins had been dating 28-year-old Elsa Segura for the prior three years. The two started their relationship in 2016 when Elsa was working as a probation officer. At the time that all of this took place, she was also working at the county's juvenile detention center. Her job gave her the ability to start looking into Lyndon's criminal past, so she found out that he had previously been convicted of aggravated robbery and was registered as a predatory offender. Turns out, during the robbery, Lyndon and his accomplices forced someone into the trunk of a car, therefore kidnapping their victim. Elsa also found out that Lyndon has a past criminal history involving illegal drug manufacturing and distribution. This did not stop her from pursuing a relationship with him. In fact, she got involved in his activities herself. Over the course of their relationship, she helped Lyndon by renting a condo for him, leasing a truck for him, buying pill presses, booking him flights, bus tickets, and hotel rooms. She did all of this under her own name, so it wasn't hard to find out this information, but I guess she didn't want it connected to Lyndon for whatever reason. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Lyndon was working at the same recording studio as John for some time. Through that, the two were known to frequent the studio at the same times and attend the same parties. They ran with a lot of the same people in their circles, so this meant that Elsa had met both John and Monique on multiple occasions. She also followed them on social media, so she knew about their kids and everything else they were posting. Then, of course, she knew about the falling out between John and Lyndon when he thought he was stealing his music, and then she knew about how Lyndon thought John was a snitch when he got arrested on those drug charges. Someone else who Lyndon worked with was a man named Barry Davis. I don't know if they were friends or if they just worked together in the drug scene, but Barry was also someone who Lyndon told about John being a snitch and being responsible for his arrest. Then, Barry Davis had a close friend, Cedric Barry. I know, a lot of Barrys, it's a little bit confusing, but Barry Davis and Cedric Barry worked close together to sell drugs, even sharing one phone at one point. So even though Cedric did not have a direct connection to Lyndon, Barry did. So both got involved in this whole mess. Nobody likes a snitch, so it's believed that Lyndon started to work with these two men to plot a revenge against John. By December 29th, 2019, two days before Monique's murder, Elsa met Lyndon after work where he showed her a real estate listing. According to investigators, he told Elsa to call Monique and try to set up a house showing in a few days so that they could confront Monique. It is thought that Elsa used her job at the detention center to look up information on Monique and obtained her number that way. According to cell phone data that same day, Cedric, Barry, and Lyndon were all together at a cell phone store in North Minneapolis. Surveillance cameras then captured Cedric entering the store to purchase and activate a cell phone. As Cedric was at the store, Lyndon and Elsa were on FaceTime for about 19 seconds. After picking up the cell phone and activating it, cell towers show that Lyndon, Cedric, Barry, and Elsa were all at Elsa's home for about a half hour. There, Elsa later told investigators that Lyndon was gathering all the information he needed to schedule a fake house showing. Now, the number associated with the burner phone they purchased was the same number used to call Monique and set up the house showing. Turns out, Elsa called Monique, giving her that fake name of Lisa as a cover. She made the call from a parking lot to avoid having the call traced back to her and scheduled the house showing for 11 a.m. on December 30th. After this first appointment was set up, Lyndon and Elsa met back up at her home there, Lyndon told Elsa to make sure she stayed away from her home when calling Monique and to leave her personal cell phone at home when she went to the fake showing. After meeting up with Elsa at her home, Lyndon met up with another individual and asked him to rent the smallest available U-Haul for the following day. The friend agreed to let Lyndon rent the U-Haul, but said that it wouldn't be available until later in the day on December 30th. 
So it was after finding this out that Lyndon called Elsa back to tell her to reschedule the house showing for the following day because if they kept the appointment the same, they wouldn't have had the U-Haul ready. That is why the appointment got rescheduled for December 31st at 3 p.m. By 9.30 p.m. on December 30th, Lyndon, Cedric, and Barry were captured on surveillance video at a store purchasing bleach, ammonia, two-way radios, and a canvas tent. After leaving the store and meeting back up with Elsa, she confirmed the appointment that was set for Monique. The following day, now the morning of December 31st, Cedric met up with the friend to rent the U-Haul. I guess the U-Haul was being rented out in exchange for heroin, so clearly not a legal transaction. Then, as we know, by 3 p.m. on December 31st, Monique arrived to the home in Maple Grove with the U-Haul pulling up shortly after. Surveillance video from a neighbor's doorbell camera showed as they parked the U-Haul in the driveway, then followed Monique inside where they grabbed her and shoved her in the back of the U-Haul. As I stated, the U-Haul then drove around different areas of Minneapolis for two hours with Monique inside. At one point, the U-Haul was captured on surveillance video in an area near Cedric's cousin's house, while Cedric and Barry's cell phones also showed they were in the same area. Minutes later, cameras now pick up both the U-Haul as well as Cedric's car driving right behind. By 5.16 p.m., the U-Haul is then seen circling around the block where Monique's mother's house is located. By 5.40 p.m., Cedric and Barry then used Monique's house key to enter the home and confront John, shooting him multiple times with his children still in the home. After this, finally, by 6.30 p.m., the U-Haul, as well as Cedric's tan sedan, were seen parked in a residential area of North Minneapolis. Once again, both Cedric and Barry's phones are also in that area. It was at this time that a resident heard gunshots coming from an alley before seeing the U-Haul and tan sedan driving away. As we know, it was at this time that Monique was found dead after suffering from multiple gunshot wounds. As I stated before, at the scene of John's shooting, investigators found shell casings from a 45 caliber pistol. Well, there were also 45 caliber casings found near Monique's body as well. All of this showed that both Cedric and Barry were present for John's shooting as well as for Monique's murder. After finding out all of this information, investigators came to the conclusion that Elsa had worked with Lyndon to set up a fake showing as a way to lure Monique to get her alone. Then he paid Cedric Barry and Barry Davis to take Monique and kidnap her and torture her until she gave up information about John and his whereabouts. They tortured her for two hours before finally they figured out where he lived, they pulled up to his home and shot him using the key that they probably took from Monique. After shooting John, they probably felt like they couldn't leave a witness behind, so they took Monique to an alley and shot her. After shooting and killing Monique, they returned the U-Haul to the owner. Of course, police were able to track down the U-Haul, and once they looked inside, they found that it had a very strong smell of bleach and ammonia, indicating that there had been an intense cleanup. Inside, they also found spots of blood, four pink press-on fingernails, as well as zip ties. Upon forensic examination, they found that the blood, as well as the DNA found on the press-on nails, did match Monique's DNA. Of course, all of this information pointed directly at 41-year-old Cedric Barry and 40-year-old Barry Davis, so by January 2nd, police did arrest and charge both men on suspicion of murder. At the time, police also searched Cedric's tan sedan, a 2002 Buick Regal. In the center council, they found 13 pouches of heroin, as well as the mask with the cutout eyes that he apparently wore when shooting John. So clearly, 
police have what seems like an airtight case against Barry and Cedric. There were arguments made that there was only one shooter in this, so both shouldn't be charged with murder, but both were present and fully participating in all of it, so they should both be equally charged in all of this. But at this point, there are still two others who are thought to be involved in this whole murder plot who have not yet been arrested. So going back just a bit, on the evening of Monique's murder, so December 31st, Elsa worked a shift at the juvenile detention center from 6 to 10 p.m. During her shift, she was using her phone to make internet searches relating to stress and anxiety. After her shift, she and Lyndon had made several calls to one another. This wouldn't have been too unusual, except that these calls were more than double the length of time as any other calls the two would make in the past. So clearly, there was a lot to talk about. Then, in the days after Monique's death, Elsa's phone showed that she had read numerous articles on Monique's death and saved pictures of her to her phone. She also opened several articles relating to arrests made, and at work, she searched the jail roster for the Hennepin County Jail multiple times, of course, checking who was arrested. There were also Google searches on her phone for things like sacrament of a confession, legal immunity, and the term incinerator. Based on this information and everything else that I've told you up to this point, a few days after the arrests of Cedric and Barry, police arrested Elsa Segura and Lyndon Wiggins on charges of aiding and abetting the first-degree murder of Monique Bao. So the first trial was for both Barry and Cedric, which took place in June of 2021. The two did try to appeal the decision to try both men together, but because they were both thought to have pretty equal involvement, it made sense to do all of this at once. The prosecution argued that these two men were hired by Lyndon to carry out the murder because Lyndon believed that John was responsible for his arrest and subsequent time in jail. They presented all of the evidence that I've discussed up to this point, including the testimony given from the confidential informants, John's own testimony, as well as the cell phone evidence and traffic cameras. It was clear that these two men kidnapped Monique in that U-Haul, drove around with her in it for two hours, tortured her, as seen with the blood and DNA evidence, in order to get John's location. Once they had his location, they went and shot him multiple times before shooting Monique to get rid of the witness. This seemed like a very strong, rock-solid case. Now, in terms of the defense, a lot of what I've seen was basically that Barry and Cedric were trying to point the fingers at each other, but tried to do it sort of covertly. For example, Cedric testified in his own defense, saying that after an arrest in the fall of 2019, he agreed to work as an informant against Barry in relation to drug crimes. Cedric said that he knew police would be watching him closely, so there's no way he would be dumb enough to commit this crime. Cedric admitted that he did rent U-Hauls frequently to sell and move drugs, so that is what he was doing in December of 2019. He said that during the time of the murder, he actually left the U-Haul at his wife's mother's house and left his cell phone in his Buick. He then went out drinking, smoking, and selling drugs with the cars still, you know, at the mother's house, so there's no way he could have committed the murder. His phone must have just been in the car while Barry was driving around and committing the crime himself. He didn't outright say that, but he implied it. On the other hand, Barry said that he didn't even know Lyndon, so there was no reason for him to commit a murder for him. The only way he even knew Lyndon was through Cedric, so Barry alone would have had no motive for this. Again, neither of them came right out to say that the other committed the crime, basically just saying that they didn't individually do it. So, by the end of the trial, the jury of 16 went off for deliberations, and they came back with their verdict. They found both Cedric Barry and Barry Davis guilty for first-degree murder, attempted first-degree murder, and kidnapping. For these charges, they were given a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. At the sentencing, Monique's mother delivered a very emotional, impactful victim impact statement, 
her statement truly shows just how badly crimes like this affect families of victims even a year or more after the crime. On December 30th, 2019, I said goodnight and I love you to my daughter, Monique Bell, for the last time. This would also be the last time for babies who would sleep next to their mother. After this trial, it was time for Elsa Segura and Lyndon Wiggins' trials. Elsa's trial took place in September of 2021, while Lyndon's trial took place in June of 2022. And they were actually going for charges of murder, attempted murder, kidnapping, and aiding and abetting in first-degree murder. Even though the two were tried separately to avoid being too repetitive, I'm just going to discuss both trials at once. The prosecution argued that Monique's murder would never have happened if it weren't for Lyndon and Elsa working together to set it up for her to be kidnapped. The whole plot started with Lyndon's falling out with John, which led him to asking Elsa to lure Monique into that home. If Elsa didn't lure Monique, she wouldn't have been kidnapped and murdered. Therefore, both Elsa and Lyndon bear equal responsibility in her murder as the people who kidnapped her and pulled the trigger. However, at the trial, Elsa testified that even though she did do all of these things for Lyndon, such as her getting that burner phone from him and calling Monique, she had no idea it was for a murder plot. She just thought that Monique was helping Lyndon with his drug business. When she was initially arrested, she did lie to investigators about her relationship with Lyndon, as well as her knowledge of this drug business. When testifying, she said that she just wanted to distance herself from him after finding out what happened because she truly didn't know that the plan was to kidnap or kill Monique. On the other hand, Lyndon argued that the information given to the police by informants was not reliable. They were relying on these informants in the beginning to make that initial connection between Lyndon and Barry and Cedric. Without that connection, there's no way to connect Lyndon to the murder. However, again, as we know, John himself pointed out that Lyndon had beef with him. He also said that he believed Lyndon could be responsible. There were also text messages that showed that Lyndon was talking about how he believed John was responsible for his arrest. After closing arguments in both trials, the juries went off for their deliberations. And in both trials, the jury convicted both Elsa Segura and Lyndon Wiggins of first-degree murder, kidnapping, attempted murder, and aiding and abetting. 
both were given life sentences in prison. However, in yet another shocking turn of events, Elsa appealed her conviction and her appeal went all the way to the Minnesota Supreme Court and they actually overturned her convictions of murder and kidnapping. The Minnesota Supreme Court decided that Elsa is entitled to a new trial because while there was enough evidence to prove the aiding and abetting, they said that prosecutors failed to provide sufficient evidence to sustain convictions of the murder and kidnapping. They said that it can be reasonably believed that Elsa set up the fake meeting under less suspicious circumstances, not knowing that it would lead to her murder. They also found that at the trial, the jury was given erroneous instructions about determining her criminal liability. Apparently, the judge misstated the law on the liability of accomplices to murders. This error was enough to seriously affect the jurors, therefore Elsa is entitled to a new fair trial. The judge in this case stated, quote, We realize that our opinion may result in another trial involving these difficult facts and intensify the grief of those affected by the senseless acts of violence perpetrated on Bao and her boyfriend. Nevertheless, we are duty-bound to ensure that a defendant in a criminal trial is not convicted based on insufficient evidence or erroneous jury instructions that were not harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. So, Elsa is currently awaiting her new trial in jail for her aiding and abetting charges. But then... In yet another devastating blow to the family of Monique, the Minnesota Supreme Court also overturned Lyndon's conviction of murder and kidnapping. Once again, they found that the judge gave the jury erroneous instructions on the liability of accomplices. They stated, quote, The error was not harmless because it cannot be said beyond a reasonable doubt that the error had no significant impact on the verdict. In Lyndon's appeal, he also argued that the warrant to search his phone was unlawful, so his cell phone data should not have been included at trial, but that argument was rejected. Both Elsa and Lyndon were transported back to jail to await their new trials. As of right now, we don't have a date for those new trials. I love you, Mommy. And I forever love you. Growing up without their mother, Monique Bao's young daughter still healing, attempting to fill the giant hole in their family with these gravesite visits and birthday celebrations. When you look at her oldest daughter and you're like, wow, like you are Monique all over again. As part of their grieving process, the girls and their gammy dreamed up a children's adventure book based on the purple pillow their mom used to lie on while reading to them, imagining a magical journey. It's really hard because sometimes like I just grab her and I just hug her because I'm like, I can picture this just, you know, being Monique and hugging her. Sherelle Sinkfeld is Monique's cousin. As kids, together they were known as Thelma and Louise. It's not fair to not have her here with us. It's, she was taken from us. She was stolen. Four people were convicted on first-degree murder-related charges as part of a conspiracy that ultimately targeted Monique's boyfriend. The apparent motive connected to a recording label dispute and allegations of snitching on a drug-dealing operation. Last week, the Minnesota Supreme Court struck down the conviction of Elsa Segura citing insufficient evidence and bad jury instructions. Segura, a former Hennepin County probation officer who was dating the alleged plot mastermind, was serving a life sentence for luring Bao to the scene of the eventual kidnapping. And granted, your role was lesser, but the state is correct. It is still significant. The case against Segura now starts over. Sherelle insists the only option is a new trial with the same result, life with no possibility of release. Monique's life can't be released back to us. We can't get her back. So why should anyone involved in such a horrific crime be eligible for any type of freedom? We don't have any freedom. Her kids don't have any freedom. I do want to take now as a moment to note that the Minnesota Supreme Court did take a look at Cedric Barry and Barry Davis's appeals, but their convictions were upheld. Thank God. Of course, in the aftermath of all of this, with John's attempted murder and Monique's murder, John has said that he feels extremely guilty for how all of this played out. He knows that it was his involvement in drugs and his falling out with Lyndon that sparked this. He said that it felt like he murdered her. But at the same time, he said that he doesn't want people looking at him like a monster. 
He said that he wasn't this drug dealer who dealt with bad people like Cedric and Barry. In fact, he didn't even know Cedric. Although he did have past drug convictions, he said that he's not in a gang and doesn't promote that lifestyle. On the other hand, Monique's parents were trying to get custody of their daughters because they believe that their lives would be in danger if they lived with him. They believe that he is still involved in selling drugs and that his life is still in danger because of all of this. He still makes these flashy posts on social media to boast his lifestyle and his money. However, as far as I've seen, I don't know if there's been any resolution in this custody issue. All I can hope is that John and the family came to a peaceful conclusion that has the best interest of those girls in mind. But that is all of the information that I have on today's case. This was definitely a wild ride of a case. It was so very unfortunate how this all happened, knowing that Monique was tortured for hours before her life was violently ended, and for what? For some beef her boyfriend had with some other drug dealer slash recording artist. It's so tragic, and I feel so horrible for her two daughters who lost their mother in all of this. She never should have been involved in the first place. And in my opinion, I hope that at least Lyndon is found guilty of murder and kidnapping in the next trial. Truly, this would not have happened without him, and I truly believe that he deserves to spend his life in jail for that. As of for Elsa, in my heart, I feel like she did know that this was going to happen. I think she knew that Lyndon and John had a falling out, and she knew that Monique wasn't trying to get involved with selling drugs. Why would Lyndon involve himself with Monique if he had issues with John? Then, why in the world would they have to lure her under fake pretenses if they were just going to work together? That makes absolutely no sense. So yes, I do think that Elsa knew that they were trying to trick Monique into meeting up with them. I do think she knew that they were going to use her to get information to go after John. I do think she played just as much of a role in all of this as anybody else. However, about Monique being murdered, I can't say whether she knew that was going to happen. She might have just thought that they were going to extort her for information and then murder John. So... I do think she should at least be convicted of the kidnapping and the attempted murder. However, do I think there's a good chance she will be exonerated from those charges? Yes, I think there is a good chance. In fact, I think that might be what happens unless they find text messages or some other way to prove her knowledge because as of right now, there's really no way to prove that she knew they were going to murder her or John. But that's what I think and now I want to hear what you all think in all of this. Do you think Cedric and Barry got the right conviction and sentences? What do you think about Lyndon and Elsa's involvement? What do you think of their convictions being overturned and do you think they will be found guilty again? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn those notification bells to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you click the link down below and head to glassesusa.com to check out the deals they have going on right now. Also, make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.